Hi everyone, it's the 14th of October, which means it's time to review The Ghost Monument. So I'm going to come straight out and say that this is one I didn't overly enjoy last year. I didn't find it bad, but I found it a bit of a disappointment after the first episode. Going back now, I went in deliberately looking for things to like. I knew what I didn't like about it the first time around. I didn't like that it felt a bit plotless. It was just events happening after each other rather than last week where we're solving a mystery. I felt that the visuals being mostly set in sort of an arid landscape were quite dull. And I felt we didn't explore much of the characters. I don't know what I was talking about, <laughs> really. I mean, it is a story which is just a series of events rather than a plot, but it's a sort of quest narrative in that sense. It's a bit like a modern day version of the Keys of Marinus, including the prize at the end being the TARDIS. Something I really loved this time around is that the story isn't waiting for the Doctor to arrive. There were times in the Stephen Moffat era of Doctor Who where the plot couldn't get started without the Doctor. You know, I'm thinking things like uh, Good Man Goes to War and the, the whole Kaverian arc being entirely based around the Doctor. Instead, this is a pre-existing story that the Doctor and her friends drop into. The end of the race with Angstrom and Epso. As such, the Doctor and her friends find out things as we do. Whereas last week, the Doctor was able to say to her friends, hey, use your different areas of expertise to help me and I'll do the sciencey stuff. This week, they're kind of all on a level footing and they have to work together to get through this. We've got the solution to that cliffhanger, which is kind of hitchhikers-esque of the Doctor and her friends being uh, picked up at the last moment. We find out that the planet they were headed to has moved off its axis, which is why it's this arid landscape. And I love that long single shot inside Epso's cockpit, not only for the technical achievement of shooting it like that, and the acting achievement of getting through the scene without forgetting your lines, but Jodie's performance makes it so clear that one thing this Doctor cannot stand is pessimism. And Epso is a deeply pessimistic character, and very snide and snarky, and this Doctor is more sort of, no, we will do everything we can in order to land this ship. It doesn't matter if it doesn't lift off again, <laughs> so long as we've landed. Then they do get down to the planet, they meet Illyn, they get their quest, if you like. And another problem I had last year was I very quickly realised, okay, the Ghost Monument is going to be the TARDIS. When I saw the title, I figured out that the Ghost Monument is going to be the TARDIS. But again, because that is not the prize that the other two are competing for, it's sort of all right. Much like the character of the Doctor and Graham and Ryan and Yaz, are all incidental to this other story of the race that's going on. The TARDIS is incidental to that as well. I thought perhaps the end of the story might reveal that the planet's misfortunes were due to the TARDIS. I'm kind of glad it doesn't. It would not be a very good start to this Doctor for one of her first acts, albeit inadvertently, to have wrecked this planet. That wouldn't be very nice at all. As for the arid landscape, this time around, I just found the cinematography amazing. Perhaps when I watched it last year, I think I was watching it on iView, and of course that doesn't have a great data rate, and I don't have... I don't... I, 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 I do not have good internet. But there's all these scenes of contrast of the land and the sky, and the land and the water, and it's not a matter of everything is the same colour. You get these pops of green, you get the blue sky. During the night scenes, you get all those colours underground as well in the base. It's actually a very colourful story. It's just that instead of having a bunch of colours rushing at you at once, you get blocks of colour to indicate where this scene is taking place. And because we have so many locations. We've got the spaceships at the beginning, we've got Illyn's tent, we've got the desert they're crossing, we've got the river, we've got the underground area, we've got the mountain they finish on, and uh, the acetylene fields as well. Each separate zone 
is given its own distinct colour palette. And instead of feeling that this story was empty, like I did last year, I realised it was full of all these little vignettes. It is like the Keys of Marinus. And it manages to achieve that without the landscape changing a great amount through the cinematography. And it's something I really came to appreciate on this rewatch. I love the character of Angstrom. She's played with a little bit of eccentricity by Susan Lynch, but it's not overpowering. And we can probably attribute that to how much she's lost. Something that seems to be a feature of this season, though, is queer characters losing their partners. And I know that Graham has also lost Grace, but... It's a, it's a catch-22. When Graham says, I lost my wife, Angstrom is able to say, I lost mine too, which gives us a queer character. But then again, it's also fridging Angstrom's wife off-screen to give her motivation in the race. As representation, it seems to kind of come from the Star Trek Discovery School, so maybe Angstrom's wife will be brought back to life as well, and they can spend 13 episodes arguing with each other. For God's sake, Paul and Hugh talk to each other! Moving on. Each of the characters, as well, are given opportunities to be clever and prove their skills. Yaz helps crash land the spaceship. Graham and Ryan get the boat working in the acetylene fields. It's Ryan who knows about acetylene because of his work as a mechanic. The scene on the acetylene fields, I know a lot of people have expressed reservations about the timeless child and how that hasn't come up again. But of course, this year we have a concerted effort not to have a story arc. I do have faith that possibly next series we will return to the plotline of the Timeless Child and find out what that means. Because, you know, it's not like Doctor Who showrunners to bring up this idea, which obviously means that something is going to happen in the future, and then just completely abandon it and not explore it. Two things that did annoy me with the direction, though, I felt that the sniper bot sequence was not very well directed. There's a fair bit of ADR there to cover things. When Ryan comes back after trying to attack the sniper bots, I think with the shot, um, we kind of see a shadow move over the hole, but we don't actually see Ryan come inside, and then suddenly there's a sniper bot there, which has to be covered with the Doctor saying, oh no, they found us. Also... The reveal of the TARDIS interior. Now, I like the TARDIS interior. I like this TARDIS interior. But the direction going in there for the first time is not very good. And from my memory, it'll be, I think, resolution before we get some really well-directed scenes in there. I hope I'm wrong and I hope I start liking it. But, yeah, it's not even the underwhelming reactions from Graham, Ryan, and Yaz. I think that kind of subverts the usual expectation. Bit of an odd choice when you're trying to bring a new audience on board, but I don't mind it that much. It's just the way the camera moves. I don't feel we get a good sense of the space and of the design. It's like they're trying to hide it. And I really like the design. I like the rock crystal centre. I like the sort of nebulous and vague controls. I like the custard cream dispenser. <laughs> I'd like to see it dispense some other biscuits, I think. Not just custard creams. <laughs> maybe they... I don't know. Maybe they can use it for other foods. But you see, I'm, I'm laughing at it. I think it's a lovely moment. Um, but it would have been even more effective if it was undercutting something more grandiose. I think we needed grandiose direction in this scene and a massive sense of scale, particularly because it seems to be a much smaller TARDIS set than we've had in the new series before. Even with criticising the sniper bot scene, it helps re-establish that the Doctor doesn't like guns, and here it's not even that they kill people, it's that they make the people handling them stupid. And even though it gives Ryan a bit of a stupid moment, he proves himself in the episode in other ways. So it's not turning him into comic relief, but it is giving a bit of comic relief to our characters. There's more great music from Sego Nakanola, and of course we get the new title sequence and the new theme properly. I like the title sequence. I don't know how I feel about not having a pre credit scene. But at the same time, I do remember last year when I was watching these episodes, 
it gave me a bit of a classic series thrill because the classic series very rarely had pre-title scenes so it was like going back to there and you hear the music and the music is what gets you in the mood for the episode Speaking of the classic series, these titles most remind me of um, the Pertwee era with sort of the reflective seam down the middle and the patterns radiating out from that, much like they did in the Pertwee titles. Much like a lot of this series, I believe it's an attempt to go back to basics. There's no flying TARDIS, there's no face in there, it's name, 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 logo. Kind of weird having the producer and the director credits in there, but I suppose otherwise they would be going over footage from the episode, as they have done in the last couple of eras of the show. So I kind of get what they're going for, moving them into the titles, and that means once you are in the show, there's no sort of real-world credits encroaching on your experience of the show. So I kind of understand it. It's just a change, so I suppose that makes it a bit weird for me. The Ghost Monument gets a 7 out of 10 from me. It has gone up in my estimation. I think last year I gave it a 6. Uh, but it does still have its problems surrounding direction, surrounding pacing a little bit. It's not as good as The Woman Who Fell to Earth, but it's still a really cracking story, which gives us a chance to get to know our characters a bit more. It tells us that they're still grieving for Grace, it reminds us that they've only known each other really for maybe a few days, maybe a week at the most. It has gorgeous cinematography, it has a small but really effectively used guest cast, and it has a very positive message at the end as the two guest characters work together in order to get out of this situation. So the rankings for this season at the moment stand at Coming in at number one, The Woman Who Fell to Earth, and number two, The Ghost Monument. I'll be back tomorrow with some more Say Something Nice. Until then, thank you very much for watching.